right. Is the microphone on? Yes, it is. Sweet. All right. Thank you all for coming to a Christmas Carol. Um, if you all don't know me, I'm Chance Whitlatch. I am a student here at STLCC. Um, I've been here for two and a half years now, so quite some time. And a few of you know me from shows in the past. Um, I first like would I, I first would like to start off by thanking some people. Um, we've had so many people help this in in this show, and it's just been amazing. I've had so many people helping me out with every step through the show, and it's just been great. But the people that I would like to point out is uh, Charles Janik. He is actually the person who wrote um, this uh, this adaptation of A Christmas Carol. So. Thank you. We're very thankful for him. Um, Brie Puska, she is actually uh, the assistant to the director for me, and she is somebody who I definitely look up to and very respect a ton of. So you guys can clap for Brie. <laughs> um, Heather Dobrink, which she is right back there, um, she actually uh, pretty much drew and created everything on here, which uh, she is right now putting together a portfolio of all of her artwork, and she plans on going to Webster University, and she's very, very talented, and we're very glad to have her, because she's helped out with pretty much all of the artwork since she's been here for the shows, so you guys can clap with her. <laughs> uh, Justin, Justin is right back there too. He pretty much helped out with all of the maintenance and sound and everything we have here. So he's the reason that these microphones are working, which is nice. <laughs> and uh, Lydia Grace, she is the sound soundboard back there. She has, uh, she's pretty much just been thrown right into this role. She's only been doing it for a couple of days now and she's picked it up really fast and we're definitely glad we have her, so. Um, another uh, thing I would like to point out is uh, this is a radio show, so we hopefully will be um, producing the show live. I don't know if that's actually going to happen, but we do have a recorder back there that um, they're going to record, and they actually have a YouTube channel that it's going to be put on. So if you guys, if you guys know anyone that couldn't make it to the show or any grandparents that would be interested in seeing any of the beautiful actors up here. Um, we will have it on YouTube. Also, if we can't um, put the show live today, um, we have the rights to pretty much play it whenever we want to since they are recording it. And uh, since we have a... Uh, when you say produce it live, what do you mean? Um, like straight to the radio station. Oh. Okay. Yeah, like, like as they're speaking, it'll go right to the radio station. Oh. So. Hopefully they can get that working. I don't know if they could, but we actually are recording it right um, right now so that uh, since we have the rights, since Charles Janik, a former director here, re, uh, wrote the script, he, um, he gave us the rights to pretty much do whatever we want to do with it. And up until Christmas, the radio channel will put out um, different dates and times that they plan on showing it on the radio channel so you guys can listen to it again if you want. Alrighty. Um, so I think the last person I would like to thank is uh, um, Mark Weber. He is pretty much the only reason that I am up here as a student directing this show and handling all of these beautiful actors that I have that are over there. Um, the talent here at Wildwood Community College is just amazing. Like there's so many different people like not everyone over there is thinking that they want to go into the theater field and all of that but there's some people that do um, one of them Nick Kime he wants to be a voice actor he's beautiful at voices a lot of the kids know Nick because he handles a lot of the work with the kids so there's just so much talent over there and I'm really glad that I got the chance to work with everyone and also I would like to thank the parents of any of these actors up here. We can clap for the parents, everyone. Yeah. 
because yeah, uh, without you guys, they wouldn't be up here pretty much. So um, yeah, I, I, I would just like to thank everyone for coming and uh, I hope you guys enjoy the show. Um, my last thing, my last thing I would like to say is um, I would like to thank my parents who are sitting right over there, Tim and Tammy Whitlatch. Um, thanks for coming. Uh, they they love everything I do. They love everything I do. They they are supportive of everything that I do, and I'm just very very thankful to have them. And uh, I would also like to thank um, my four other siblings. Um, I I had an older sister. Her name was Shiloh. Uh, when we were younger, she passed away from leukemia. So I'm very thankful for her in my life and for changing my life in a pretty big way. Um, my brother Austin, actually in December, is uh, going to graduate and he's going for nursing, so hopefully he can do something good in the world as a nurse, that's amazing. And uh, my two little siblings over there, uh, Skylar, he's, he's the person that pretty much looks exactly like me, we're pretty much twins. Um, and then my little beautiful sister Cheyenne, who's very shy, and she's just an adorable little princess. But yeah, um, really, without, without my sister's passing when we were younger, my siblings wouldn't exist. So I'm very thankful for some tragedy that pretty much created something beautiful. And I, I just really love my little siblings. So they're just a blessing in my heart. So what? What? My name? Yeah. Chance Whitlatch. Yes. Um, and yes, I hope you guys enjoy a Christmas Carol. My name is Chance Whitlatch. I am the student director here, and this was written by Charles Janik. So I hope you guys enjoy. Christmas Carol, a story more beloved and famous than almost any other Christmas story. Yet, it might be more accurate to consider it a ghost story rather than a pleasant holiday tale. It begins with the death and proceeds in the cold and dark. It is inhabited by ghosts and spirits. In your mind, transport yourself to London in the early 1800s, at the height of the Industrial Revolution. Money is power. For those that have it to lend, it is a way to even greater wealth. Jacob Marley is dead. This is certain. Dead as a doornail, if not a coffin nail. Come, let me sign the register and be done with this business. The vicar, undertaker, and clerk have signed already. He died without heir, and with my signature, I take possession of all his earthly goods. Clerk, is that not so? Yes, Mr. Scrooge. As a surviving partner in the firm of Scrooge and Marley, all his assets become the property of the surviving partner. There, it is done. Now, give me the deed and keys to his house. I may profit a bit from the sale of its contents. It is more economical than my present lodgings. I have business at the exchange, and this exercise has delayed me. Good day, gentlemen. Good day, Good day to you, Mr. Mr. Scrooge. Scrooge. What a hard man. His partner died upon Christmas Eve, and I understand Scrooge kept regular hours at his place of business that day. He made no effort to comfort his friend as the man was dying, a man he worked shoulder to shoulder with for all those years. Tis true, Vicar. As I waited there for Marley to shuffle off to mortal coil, Scrooge did not arrive until just before he expired. It was near 11 on the clock when Scrooge made his appearance. He went in and spoke a few words to Marley, and he expired. He directed me to provide the most costly funeral possible and left. He told me he was aware well of the contents of the house and expected no thievery. He spent no more than a quarter hour there that night. So Scrooge is rich, but shows him not how worldly. He's a shrewd man of business. His name carries great weight on the exchange. If he backs a venture, others will also, on his reputation alone. All true. Well, what of his heavenly accounts? Years pass, and another Christmas Eve is here at the firm of Scrooge and Marley. The cold and dark and closes in upon the employer the lone employee. Oh, I'm just doing some thick items. 
Bob, what is going on? You better not be about wanting more coal for your fire. I told you, any more discussion on that point, we can part our acquaintance. You should be noticing the legend. Put on your gloves and comfort, man, and stop dallying. Outrageous. Can I have no peace and quiet while I work? Cratchit, stop that loathsome sound. I'll deal with this nuisance. Be off with you. Go elsewhere and bother someone else. Merry Christmas, sir. Please, can you spare a crumb or coin for us? It is cold and we are hungry. Be gone, I tell you, or I'll get that beetle to give you a good thrashing. Don't come back. Oh, my, you gave me a start. A Merry Christmas, Uncle. God save you. <laughs> Humbug. Christmas a humbug, Uncle? You don't mean that, I'm sure. I do. Merry Christmas. What right have you to be merry? What reason have you to be merry? You're poor enough. Come then, what right have you to be dismal? What reason have you to be morose? You're rich enough. <laughs> humbug! Don't be cross, Uncle. What else can I be? When I live in such a world of fools as this, Merry Christmas. Out upon Merry Christmas. What's Christmas time to you? But a time for paying bills without money. A time for finding yourself a year older but not an hour richer. If I could work my will, every idiot who goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips should be boiled with his own pudding and buried with a stake of holly through his heart. He should. Uncle! Nephew! Keep Christmas in your own way and let me keep it in mine. Keep it, but you don't keep well, then it. Then let me leave it alone then. Much good may it do you. Much good has it ever done you. There are many things from which I might have derived good by which I have not profited, I dare mm. say. And therefore, uncle, though it has never put a scrap of gold or silver in my pocket, I believe that it has done me good and will do me good. And I say, God bless it. Let me hear another sound from you, and I'll keep your Christmas by losing your situation. You're quite a powerful speaker, sir. I wonder you don't go into Parliament. Don't be angry, uncle. Come, dine with us tomorrow. When hell freezes over, nephew. But why? Why? Why did you get married? Because I fell in love. Because you fell in love. Good afternoon. Nay, uncle. But you never came to see me before that happened. Why give that as a reason for not coming now? Good afternoon. I want nothing from you. I ask nothing of you. Why cannot we be friends? Good afternoon. I am sorry with all my heart to find you so resolute. We have never had any quarrel to which I have been a party. So Merry Christmas, uncle, and a Happy New Year. Good afternoon. Merry Christmas to you, Bob. Merry Christmas, Mr. Fred. <laughs> There's another fellow, my clerk, with 15 shillings a week, talking about a Merry Christmas. I'll retire to Bedlam, damn Fred. Oh, let this gentleman in. I will not, I must be allowed to complete my day's business. Scrooge and Marley's, have I the pleasure of dressing Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley? Mr. Marley has been dead these seven years. He died seven years ago this very night. I have no doubt that his generosity is well represented <laughs> by a surviving partner. Here are our credentials. At this festive season of the year, Mr. Scrooge, it is more than usually desirable that we should make some slight provisions for the poor and destitute who suffer greatly at this present time. Mm. Many and thousands are in want of common necessities. Hundreds and thousands are in want of common comfort, sir. Are there no prisons? Uh, plenty of prisons. And the union workhouses, are they still in operation? They are still, I wish I could say they're not. Mm. The treadmill and the poor law are in full vigor then. Uh, both are very busy, sir. Oh, I was afraid from what you said at first that something has occurred to stop them in their useful course. I'm very glad to hear it. They scarcely furnish Christian cheer of mind or body. To the multitude, a few of us are endeavoring to raise a fund to buy some poor, some meat and drink, and means of warmth. We choose this time that it is the best time of all others mm. when want is keenly felt and abundance rejoices. Uh, what should I put you down for? Nothing. You wish to be anonymous? <laughs> I wish to be left alone. Since you ask me what I wish, sir, this is my answer. I don't make Merry Christmas myself, and I can't afford to make idle people merry. I help support the establishments I have mentioned. They cost enough, and those who are badly off must go there. Many can't go there, and many would rather die. <laughs> well, they would rather die. They had better do it and decrease the surplus population. Surely you can't mean that. It's not my business. It's enough for a man to understand his own business and not to interfere with other people's. Mine occupies me constantly. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Mr. Scrooge, sure it is seven on the clock. <sighs> You'll want all day tomorrow, I suppose. It's quite convenient. Sir. It's not convenient, and it's not fair. If I was to stop half a crown for it, you'd think yourself ill-used, I'll be bound. 
<laughs> and yet you don't think me ill-used when I pay a day's wages for no work. Mr. Scrooge, it is Christmas and only once a year. A poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December. But I suppose you must have the whole day be here all the earlier next morning. Yes, sir. Close up the office. Now give me the key. Off with you. Though it was cold, Bob Cratchit headed home to Camden Town in a joyous mood. He did all this without any great coat to keep him warm. Scrooge headed to his house. It was, of course, Molly's old house, having become an even darker spot in an already dark part of London. Oh. Someone there? Show yourself. No one. <sighs> Must be the wind. Where did I put that key? That's strange. The knocker looks... Can't be. I haven't thought about him in seven years. Check the rooms. Good. No one is here but me. Ah, bolted in now. A nice fire before retiring. What? Is that Jacob? No. This candle must be sputtering. Let me sit by the fire a while. It's humbug still. <laughs> How did you get in here? What do you want with me? Much. Who are you? Ask me who I was. Who were you then? You're particular for a shade. In life, I was your partner, Jacob Marley. Can you, uh, can you sit down? I can. Well, do it then. You don't believe in me. <laughs> I don't. What evidence would you have of my reality beyond that of your senses? I don't know. Why do you doubt your senses? Because a little thing affects them. Slight disorder of the stomach makes them cheat. You may be an undigested bit of beef, a blot of mustard, a crumb of cheese, a fragment of an underdone potato. There's more of gravy than of grave about you, whatever you are. You see this toothpick? I do. You are not looking at it. But I see it nonetheless. Well, I have but to swallow this and be for the rest of my days persecuted by a legion of goblins, all of my own creation. Humbug, I tell you. Humbug. Oh! oh! Man, mercy, dreadful apparition. Why do you trouble me? Man of the worldly mind, do you believe in me or not? I do, I must. But why do spirits walk the earth? Why do they come to me? It is required of every man that the spirit within him should walk abroad among his fellow men and travel far and wide. And if that spirit does not go forth in life, it is condemned to do so after death. Oh. It is doomed to wander through the world. Oh, woe is me, and witness what it cannot share, but might have shared on earth, and turned into happiness. Oh! You are fettered. Tell me why. I wear the chain I forged in life. I made it link by link, and yard by yard. I girded it on of my own free will, and of my own free will I wore it. Is its pattern strange to you? It is uh, cash boxes, keys, padlocks, ledgers, deeds, and heavy purses wrought in steel. Or would you know the weight and length of the strong coil you bear yourself? It was full, as heavy, and as long as this, seven Christmas Eves ago. Oh, my. You have labored on it since. It is a ponderous chain. Jacob, old Jacob Marley, tell me more. Speak comfort to me, Jacob. I have none to give. My spirit never walked beyond our counting house. Mark me. Yes. In life, my spirit never roved beyond the narrow limits of our money-changing hole. And weary journeys lie before me. Seven years dead and traveling all that time. The whole time. No rest. No peace. Incessant torture of remorse. You travel fast. On the wings of the wind. You might have gotten over a great quantity of ground in seven years. 
Oh, oh! oh not to know that no space of regret can make amends for one's life's opportunity misused. Yet such was I, oh, such was I. But you were always a good man of business, Jacob. Business? Mankind was my business. The common welfare was my business. Charity, mercy, and forbearance, benevolence were all my business. At this time of the rolling year, I suffer most. Hear me, my time is nearly gone. I am here tonight to warn you that you have yet a chance and hope of escaping my fate. Ooh. A chance and hope of my procuring, Ebenezer. You were always a good friend to me. Thank you. You will be haunted by three spirits. Is that the chance and hope you mentioned, Jacob? It is. I think I'd rather not. Without their visits, you cannot hope to shun the path I tread. Expect the first tomorrow when the bell tolls one. Uh, couldn't I take them all at once and have it over, Jacob? Expect the second the next night at the same hour. The third upon the next night when the last stroke of twelve is past vibrating. Look to see me no more and look that for your own sake. You remember what has passed between us. Come with me to the window and see my fate. Are these the poor souls like you, Jacob? Powerless to intervene in the lives of their fellow men for good? But Marley was gone and the vision faded from his sight. Hum. That is not possible. I went to bed after two. Is it past noon? Something happened to the sun? Must be a faulty clock. Suddenly the bed curtains parted and the room was filled with light. The source of the illumination resolved into a figure. Are you the spirit, sir, whose coming was foretold to me? I am. Who and what are you? I am the ghost of Christmas past. Long past? No, your past. Your head is so bright. Would you put your cap on to reduce the glow? What would you so soon put out with worldly hands the light I give? Is it not enough that you are one of those whose passions made this cap? Mm. It forced me through whole trains of years to wear it low upon my brow. I, I did not mean to offend. I do not recall willfully bonneting you. What business brings you here? Your welfare. Much obliged, but would not a night of unbroken rest have been more conducive to that end? Your reclamation, then. Take heed. As I clasp your hand, rise and walk with me out the window. Oh, it is well below freezing. I am clad but lightly in slippers, dressing gown, and nightcap. I have a cold. Uh, I am a mortal and liable to fall. Bear but a touch of my hand there upon your heart, and you should be upheld in more than this. Oh, where is the city gone? It is day. We are in the country. Mm. Snow-covered fields. Good heavens! I was a boy boarded at school here. Your lip is trembling. Then what is that upon your cheek? A tear? A, a pimple is all. Lead me where you will. Do you recollect the way? Remember it. I could walk it blindfolded. Strange to have forgotten it for so many years. Let us go on. Dear, dear brother, I have come to bring you home, dear brother, to bring you home, home, home. Home, little fan? Yes, home for good and all. Home forever and ever. Father is so much kinder than he used to be. That home's like heaven. He spoke so gently to me one dear night when I was going to bed that I was not afraid to ask him once more if you might come home. And he said, yes, you should, and sent me in a coach to bring you. And you never to come back here, but first we're together all the Christmas long and have the merriest time in all the world. You are quite a woman, little fan. Well, come on, let us gather your things. Bring down the Master Scrooge's box there. Set it upon the carriage. Home, fan? Yes, home, Ebenezer. Oh, he's a delicate creature, a wonderful rest might have withered. But she had a large heart. So she had. You're right, I will not gainsay it, spirit. God forbid. She died a woman and had, as I think, children? One child. True, your nephew. Yes. <gasps> know it? Was I not apprenticed here? Why, <gasps> it's old Fezziwig! Bless his heart, it's Fezziwig alive again! Yo ho there, boys! Ebenezer! Dick! Dick Wilkins, to be sure. Bless me, yes, there he is! He was very much attached to me, was Dick? Oh, dear, dear, dear. Yo ho, my boys! No more work tonight! Christmas Eve, Dick! Christmas, Ebenezer! 
Let's have the shutters open before a man can say Jack Robinson. Hitty ho, clear the way, my lads. And let's have lots of room here. Hitty ho, Dick, cheer up, Ebenezer. Let the festivities begin. The dancing continued till 11. Then the fizzy wigs bid us all farewell. Smoke! Dick, what a wonderful evening. Fuzzy Wig is the best master. It isn't that. It isn't that spirit. He had the power to render us happy or unhappy, to make our service light or burdensome, a pleasure or a toil. The happiness he gives is quite as great as if it cost a fortune. I would like to have been able to say a word or two to my clerk just now. That's all. My time grows short. Quick. Oh, no, not this place, Spirit. I can't bear it. Yes, oh. here. I believe you were in love once. It matters little. To you, very little. Another idol has displaced me, and if it can cheer and comfort you in times to come, as I would have tried to do, I have no just cause to grieve. Belle, what idol has displaced you? A golden one. This is the even-handed dealing of the world. There is nothing on which it is so hard as poverty, and there is nothing it professes to condemn with such severity as the pursuit of wealth. You fear the world too much. All of your hopes have merged in the hope of being beyond the chance of its sordid reproach. I have seen your nobler aspirations fall one by one until the master passion, gain, engrosses you. Have I not? What then? Even if I have grown so much wiser, what then? I am not changed towards you, have I? Our contract is an old one. It was made when we were both poor and content to be so, until in a good season, we can improve our worldly fortunes by our patient industry. You are changed. When it was made, you were another man. I was a boy. Your own feelings tell me that you were not what you are. I am. That which promised happiness when we were one in heart is fraught with misery, now that we are two. How often and how keenly I have thought this, I will not say. It is enough that I have thought it and can release you. Have I ever sought release? In words? No, never. In what then? In a changed nature, in an altered spirit, in another atmosphere of life, another hope as its great end. In everything that made my love of any worth or value in your sight, if this had never been between us, tell me, would you seek me out and try to win me now? No. You think not? I would gladly think otherwise if I could. Heaven knows. But if you were free today, tomorrow, yesterday, can I even believe that you would choose a dowerless girl? You, who in your very confidence with her, weigh everything by gain. I release you. Will a full heart for the love of who you once were May you be happy in the life you have chosen. Spirit, show me no more. Conduct me home. Why do you delight to torture me? Remove me. I cannot bear it. Leave me. Take me back. Haunt me no longer. And Scrooge seized the spirit's cap and forced it upon that light, extinguishing the scene, returning him to his sleep. Oh, what? He must have fallen asleep. What time is it? Can't be tomorrow. There's a light under the door. Is the sitting room a fire? I smell no smoke. I'm sure the fire was out when I retired. Oh, Scrooge! So, it is a person, not a conflagration. <laughs> Come in! Come in and know me, better man! I am the ghost of Christmas present. Look upon me. You have never seen the like of me before. You are a giant as I have never seen. Have you never walked forth with the younger members of my family? Meaning, for I am very young, my elder brothers born these later years? I don't think I have. I am afraid I have not. Have you had many brothers, Spirit? <laughs> More than 1,800. <laughs> A tremendous family to provide for. Spirit, conduct me where you will. I went forth last night on compulsion, and I learned a lesson which is working now. Tonight, if you have aught to teach me, let me profit by it. Touch my robe. At the touch, the room disappeared. They were in the streets at midday, the cheerfulness of the crowd contrasting it with the shabbiness of the buildings and streets. I noticed you sprinkling something from that horn you carry on food and beverage. Is it a season? Is there a peculiar flavor in what you sprinkle? There is my own. Would you apply to any kind of dinner on this day? To any kind of dinner. Why to a poor one most? Because it needs it most. Oh, we are moving quite quickly to the suburbs. Where are we going? 
Camden Town. What is this place? The home of your clerk. It deserves a substantial sprinkling from my horn. Think on it, for he needs it much. He pockets on Saturdays but 15 copies of his Christian name. What has ever got your precious brother, father then and your brother, Tiny Tim? I hope Martha isn't as late as last Christmas. Here's Martha, mother. Here's, Here's Martha, Martha, mother. Martha. Hurrah! Hurrah! There's, There's such, such a goose, goose Martha. <laughs> Why, bless your heart alive, my dear, how late you are. We did a deal of work to finish up last night and had to clear away this morning, mother. Well, never mind, so long as you are come. Sit ye down before the fire, my dear, and have a warm Lord bless you. No, no, no there's father coming. coming. Hide, Martha, hide! Why, where's our Martha? Not coming. Not coming? Not coming upon Christmas Day. Here I am, father. I can't bear to tease you. And how did little Tim behave? As good as gold and better. Somehow he gets thoughtful sitting by himself so much. And tiny Tim, what do you think on in church? <laughs> saw me because I'm crippled, and it might be pleasant to them to remember upon Christmas Day who made lame beggars walk and blind men see. Indeed, Tim, you think the strangest things. Go check on the pudding children. Bob, as you've the goose from the bakers, we must set the table. Hurrah! Hurrah! There never was such a goose. The Cratchits consumed the goose and left not a crumb. Now where is that pudding? Suppose it should not be done enough. Suppose it should break in turning out. Suppose somebody should have got over the wall of the backyard and stolen it while they were married with the goose. Here it is! Oh, a wonderful pudding. The weight is off my mind. I had my doubts about the quantity of flour. Now, a toast of Christmas punch. A Merry Christmas to us all, my dears. God bless us. God bless us! God bless us, everyone! <laughs> Spirit, tell me if Tiny Tim will live. I see a vacant seat in the poor chimney oh. corner and a crutch without an owner, carefully preserved. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, the child will die. No, no, oh no, kind spirit, say he will be spared. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, none other of my race will find him here. What then? If he be like to die, he had better do it and oh. decrease the surplus population. You hurt me again with my own words. Man, if man knew me in heart, not adamant, Forbear that wicked cant until you have discovered what the surplus is and where it is. Will you decide what men shall live, what men shall die? It may be that in the sight of heaven, you are more worthless and less fit to live than millions like this poor man's child. Oh God, to bear the insect on the leaf, pronouncing on the too much life among his hungry brothers in the dust. Mr. Scrooge, I'll give you Mr. Scrooge, the founder of the feast. The founder of the feast, indeed. I wish I had him here. I'd give him a piece of my mind to feast upon, and I'd hope he'd have a good appetite for it. Uh, my dear, the children, Christmas Day. It should be Christmas Day. I am sure on which one drinks the health of such an odious, stingy, hard, unfeeling man as Mr. Scrooge. You know he is, Robert. Nobody knows it better than you do, poor fellow. Uh, my dear, Christmas Day. I'll drink his health for your sake, and the day's not for his. Long life to him, a Merry Christmas, and a Happy New Year. He'll be very merry and very happy, I have no doubt. I have an eye for a situation, Master Peter, which would bring in, if obtained, full five and sixpence weekly. Come, we have more places to visit. <laughs> Why, that is Fred's laugh. Are we at Fred's house? He said that Christmas was a humbug as I live. He believed it, too. More shame for him, Fred. He's a comical old fellow, and that's the truth. And not so pleasant as he might be. However, his offenses carry their own punishment, and I have nothing to say against him. I'm sure he is very rich, Fred. At least, you always tell me so. What of that, my dear? His wealth is of no use to him. He doesn't do any good with it. He doesn't make himself comfortable with it. He hasn't the satisfaction of thinking <laughs> that he is ever going to benefit us with it. I have no patience with him. Oh, I have. I am sorry for him. I couldn't be angry with him if I tried. Who suffers by his ill whims? Himself, always. He irritates it into his head to dislike us. And he won't come and dine with us. What's the consequence? He won't lose much of a dinner. Indeed, I think he loses a very good dinner. <laughs> very, very good, good dinner, dinner indeed. indeed. Well, I'm very glad to hear it, because I haven't great faith in these young housekeepers. What do you say, Topper? That is a bachelor, and therefore a wretched outcast. I have no opinion to express on the subject. <clears throat> do go on, Fred. He never finishes what he begins to say. He's such a ridiculous fellow. <laughs> 
I was only going to say that the consequence of his taking a dislike to us and not making merry with us is, as I think, that he loses some pleasant moments which could do him no harm. I mean to give him the same chance every year, whether he likes it or not, before I pity him. Well, how about some music now? Excellent! Excellent. Please, play something old and sweet. That tune, it was fan's favorite. How oh, I miss her. Let us play yes and no. Well, here is a new game. Only half hour spirit, only one. Is it an animal? Yes. Live animal? Yes. A rather disagreeable animal? Yes. A savage animal? Yes. An animal that growled and grunted sometimes? Yes. And talked sometimes and lived in London? Yes. And walked about the streets and wasn't made a show of? Yes. And wasn't led by anybody? Yes. And didn't live in a menagerie? Yes. And was never killed in a market? Yes. It was not a horse, or an ass, or a cow, or a bull, or a tiger, or a dog, or a pig, or a cat, or a bear? <laughs> yes. I have found it out. I know what it is, Fred. I know what it is. What is it? It's your Uncle Scrooge. It is indeed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he has given us plenty of merriment, I'm sure, and it would be ungrateful not to drink to his health. Uncle Scrooge! To, to Uncle, Uncle Scrooge! Scrooge. Um, my time grows short. It's dark here in the street. You look to have aged a great deal in the space of a day. Are spirits' lives so short? My life upon this globe is very brief. It ends tonight. Tonight? Tonight at midnight. Hark, the time is drawing near. Forgive me if I am not justified in what I ask, but I see something strange and not belonging to yourself, protruding from your robe. Is it a foot or a claw? It might be a claw, for all the flesh there is upon it. Look here at two miserable children. Oh. Wretched, oh. abject, oh. frightful, and hideous. Oh, man, look here! Look! Look down here! Oh, spirit, are they yours? They are man's, and they cling to me. This boy is ignorant. Oh. This girl is want. Beware them both, and all of their degree. But most of all, beware this boy. For on his brow I see that written, which is doom, unless the writing be erased. Have they no refuge or resource? Are there no prisons? Oh. Are there no workhouses? Are there no prisons? Are there no workhouses? And all was enveloped in a thick, inky darkness on the last chime. Scrooge could see nothing and thought he was blind. As he reached out in the darkness, his hands found a form. Oh, I am filled with dread. Am I in the presence of the ghost of Christmas yet to come? The form remained silent. The darkness began to lift, yet the figure of darkness remained. An all-consuming black form. Oh, you are about to show me shadows of the things that have not happened, but will happen in the time before us. Is that so, spirit? Yes, I believe it is so, for I think I saw the hood of your garment incline. Still no reply. Ghost of the future, I fear you more than any specter I have seen. But as I know your purpose is to do me good, and as I hope to live to be another man from what I was, I am prepared to bear your company. Do it with a thankful heart. Will you not speak to me? A hand appeared from the robe and pointed the way in silence. Lead on, lead on. Night is waning fast, and it is precious time to me, I know. Lead on, spirit. The phantom began to move in the direction pointed. Scrooge followed in its shadow and felt as if he was being carried along by it. The city seemed to move rather than the two figures. Faster it went till the scene ceased to blur. <laughs> I recognize this place. We are at the exchange. <clears throat> I conduct business here. No, I don't know much about it either way. I only know he's dead. When did he die? Last night, I believe. Why? What was the matter with him? I thought he'd never die. God knows. <laughs> <laughs> what, what has he done with his money? I haven't heard. Left it to his company, perhaps. He hasn't left it to me, that's all I know. It's likely to be a very cheap funeral. For all upon my life, I don't know if anybody to go. Suppose we make a party and volunteer. 
I don't mind going if a lunch is provided, but I must be fed if I make one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am the most disinterested among you. After all, I never wear white gloves, and I never eat lunch. But I'll go if anybody else will. When I come to think of it, I wasn't sure if I was his most particular friend, for we used to stop and speak whenever we met. Goodbye. Hmm. I am not over there at my usual spot under the clock. And at that, the city flew by in a blur. This is a down part of the city. Look here, old Joe. Here's a chance. If we haven't all three met here without meaning it. You couldn't have met in a better place. Come into the parlor. Stop till I stop the, do the shop. Ah, how it squeaks. There isn't such a rusty bit of metal in the place as its own hinges, I believe. And I'm sure there's no such old bones here as mine. <laughs> We're all suitable to our calling. We're all well matched. Come into the parlor. Come on into the parlor. What odds, then? What odds, Mrs. Dilber? Every person has a right to take care of themselves. He always did. That's true, indeed. No man more so. Why, then, don't stand there staring as if you was afraid, woman. Who's the wiser? We're not going to pick holes in each other's coats, I suppose. No, indeed, we should hope not. <laughs> Very well, then. That's enough. Who's the worst for the loss of a few things like these? Not a dead man, I suppose. No, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> if he wanted to keep him after he was dead, the wicked old screw, why wasn't he natural in his lifetime? If he had been, he'd have had somebody to look after him when he was struck with death instead of lying, gasping out there his last alone by himself. It's the truest word that ever was spoke. It's a judgment on him. I wish it would have been a little heavier judgment, and it should have been. You may depend upon it if I could have laid my hands on anything else. Open that bundle, old Joe, and let me know the value of it. Speak out plain. I'm not afraid to be the first, nor afraid for them to see it. We know pretty well that we're helping ourselves before we met here, I believe. It's no sin. Open the bundle, Joe. Show that we are all honest with each other. Uh, allow me to go first. A seal, a pencil case, a pair of sleeve buttons, and a brooch of no great value. Three shillings, and I wouldn't give another six pence if I were to be boiled for not doing it. Who's next? Here, Joe. Open my bundle. Uh, sheets, towels, apparel, two old-fashioned silver teaspoons, a pair of sugar tongs, and a few boots. Hmm. Seven shillings, six pence. I always give too much to the ladies. It's a weakness of mine, and that's the way I'll ruin myself. If you asked me for another penny and made it an open question, I'd repent for being so liberal and knock off half a crown. And now undo my bundle, Joe. Why, what do you call this? Why, it's bed curtains. Yes, <laughs> bed curtains. You don't mean to say you took them down, rings and all, with him lying there. Yes, I do. Why not? You were born to make your fortune. I certainly shan't hold my hand when I can't get anything in it by reaching it out. For the sake of such a man as he was, I promise you, Joe, don't drop that oil upon the blankets now. His blankets? Whose else's do you think? He isn't likely to take cold without him, I dare say. I hope he didn't die of anything catching, yeah? Don't you be afraid of that. I ain't so fond of his company that I'd loiter about him for such things if he did. Ah, you may look through that shirt till your eyes ache, but you won't find a hole in it nor a threadbare place. It's the best he had, and a fine one, too. They'd have wasted it if it hadn't been for me. What do you call wasting it? Putting it on him to be buried in, to be sure. Somebody was fool enough to do it, but I took it off again. If calico ain't good enough for such a purpose, it isn't good enough for anything. It's quite as becoming to the body. He can't look uglier than he did in that one. <laughs> Spirit, I see. I see. The case of this unhappy man might be my own. My life lends that way now. The city had flown by, and the spirit had brought Scrooge to a bedroom, with a figure covered in a white sheet upon the bed. Oh, merciful heaven! What is this? The specter pointed to the prone figure's head. Where are the mourners, and this man's kin? Oh, sad man. Spirit, this is a fearful place. In leaving it, I shall not leave its lesson. Trust me, let us go. Still the ghost pointed to the figure's head. I understand you, and I would do it if I could. But I have not the power, spirit. I have not the power. Let me see some tenderness connected with a death or this dark chamber. Spirit, it will be forever present to me. The room dissolved and the streets sped by till the pair found themselves in a home that was heaped in sadness. This is the Cratchit house. And he took a child and set him in the midst of them. Mother, you laid your work upon the table. The color hurts my eyes. The color? 
Ah, poor Tiny Tim. They're better now again. At least I'm weak by candlelight, and I wouldn't show weak eyes to your father when he comes home for the world. It must be near his time. Past it, rather. But I think he has walked a little slower than he used these few last evenings, Mother. I have known him walk with. I have known him walk with Tiny Tim upon his shoulder very fast indeed. And so have I, often. And, and so, so have, have we all. all. But he was very light to carry, and his father loved him so that it was no trouble. No trouble. And there is your father at the door. You have been hard at work on that piece, Mother. It should be finished by Sunday and bring a good price. Sunday? You went today then, Robert? Yes, my dear. I wish you could have gone. It would have done you good to see how green a place it is. But you'll see it often. I promised him that I would walk there on a Sunday. My little, little child. My little child. Father, Father we, we all grieve for Tiny Tim. Tim. I met Mr. Scrooge's nephew, who remarked that I looked a little down. I told him of Tim's passing, and he was the pleasantest spoken gentleman in telling me how heartily sorry for my good wife. By the by, how he ever knew that, I don't know. Knew what, my dear? Why, that you were a good wife. Everybody knows that. Very well observed, my boy. I hope they do. Heartily sorry, he said, for your good wife. If I can be of service to you in any way, he said, giving me his card, that's where I live. Pray come to me. Now, it wasn't for the sake of anything he might be able to do for us, so much as for his kind way, that this was quite delightful. It really seemed as if he had known our tiny Tim and felt with us. I'm sure he's a good soul. You would be sure of it, my dear. If you saw and spoke to him, I shouldn't be at all surprised. Mark what I say if he got Peter a better situation. Only hear that, Peter. And then Peter will be keeping company with someone and setting up for himself. Get along with you. It's just as likely as now one of these days, though there's plenty of time for that, my dear. But however and whenever we part from one another, I am sure we shall. None of us forget poor tiny Tim, <coughs> shall we, or this first parting that there was among us? Never, Father. And I know, I know, my dears, that when we recollect how patient and how mild he was, although he was a little, little child, we shall not quarrel easily among ourselves and for forget poor tiny Tim in doing it. No, no never, never Father. Father. I am very happy, I am very happy. Spirit of tiny Tim, thy childish essence was from God. Spectre, something informs me that our parting moment is at hand. I know it, but I know not how. Tell me what man that was whom we saw lying dead. The streets flew by, and the spirit and man were in desolate space. Oh, this is a graveyard. It is overrun with grass and weeds it's not cared for. You point to one of the gravestones. Before I draw nearer to the stone to which you point, Answer me one question. Are these the shadows of things that will be? Or are they the shadows of things that may be only? Men's courses will foreshadow certain ends to which, if persevered in, they must lead. But if the courses are departed from, the ends will change. Say it thus with what you show me. The name! I can't read the name. Ebenezer Scrooge! Am I that man who lay upon the bed? No, spirit, no, no! Still you point to the stone. Spirit, hear me. I am not the man I was. I will not be the man I must have been before this intercourse. Why show me this if I am past all hope? Your hand shakes. Good spirit, your nature intercedes for me and pities me. Assure me that I may yet change these shadows you have shown me by an altered life. I will honor Christmas in my heart and, and try to keep it all the year. I will live in the past, the present, and the future. The spirits of all three shall strive within me. I will not shut out the lessons that they teach. Oh, tell me that I may sponge away the writing on this stone. Let me take your hand. As Scrooge grasped the phantom's hand, the graveyard and cloak fell away. The hand became... <sighs> bedpost! It's bedpost! <laughs> I will live in the past, the present, and the future. <laughs> the spirits of all three shall strive with me. Oh, Jacob Marley, heaven in the Christmas time be praised for this. <laughs> I say it on my knees, old Jacob, on my knees. They are not torn down. They are not torn down. Rings and all. They are here. I am here. The shadows of the things that would have been may be dispelled. They will be. I know they will. Scrooge hurried to the sitting room where he had seen Marley. <laughs> There's 
the door by which the ghost of Jacob Marley entered. Uh, there's the corner where the ghost of Christmas present sat. There's the window where I saw the wandering spirits. Eat, but it's all right. It's all true. It all happened. Oh, I don't know what day of the month it is. I don't know how long I've been among the spirits. I don't know anything. Oh, I must see how the day looks. No fog, no mist, clear, bright, jovial, stirring, cold, cold, piping for the blood to dance to, golden sunlight, heavenly sky, sweet, fresh air, merry bells. Oh, glorious, glorious. You there, boy. What's today, my fine fellow? Today? Why, Christmas Day. Oh, it's Christmas Day! I haven't missed it! The spirits have done it all in one night. If they can do anything like that, of course they can, of course they can. Um, hello, my fine fellow. Hello! Do you know the Poulters in the next street but one at the corner? I should hope I do. An <laughs> intelligent boy, remarkable boy. Do you know whether they've sold the prize turkey that was hanging up there? Not the little prize turkey, the big one! What, the one as big as me? <laughs> You're a delightful boy. Yes, my buck. It's hanging there now. Is it? Go and buy it. Walker. No, no, I am in earnest. Go and buy it and tell them to bring it here that I may give them directions to where to take it. Come back with the men and I'll give you a shit. Come back with him in five minutes and I'll give you half a crown. The boy was off like a shot. I'll send it to Bob Cratchit's. You shan't know who sends it. It's twice the size of Tiny Tim. Joe Miller never made such a joke as sending it to Bob's will be. And after sending the turkey to the Cratchits, Scrooge went out among his fellow men and regarded everyone with a delighted smile. Oh, I believe that man was at my office yesterday. My dear sir, I hope you've succeeded yesterday. It was very kind of you. Merry Christmas to you, sir. Mr. Scrooge? <laughs> yes, that is my name. And I fear it may not be too pleasant to you. Allow me to ask your pardon. And will you have the goodness, uh, uh, please? Lord, bless me. My Mr. Scrooge, are you serious? <laughs> if you please, not a farthing less. A great many back payments are included in it, I assure you. Will you do me that favor? My sir, I don't know what to say to such men you- Don't say anything, please. Come and see me. Will you come and see me? I will. <gasps> thank you. I'm very much obliged to you. I thank you 50 times. Bless you. Scrooge attended Christmas <laughs> services and then went on to his nephew's house. He paced outside, back and forth, for a good while to get up the courage. May I help you, sir? Is your master at home, my dear? Yes, sir. Where is he, my love? He's in the dining room, sir, along with mistress. I'll show you upstairs, if you please. Thank you. He knows me. I'll go in here, my dear. Fred! <laughs> Why, bless my soul, who's that? It's I, your Uncle Scrooge. I have come to dinner. Will you let me in, Fred? Let you in. Why, Uncle, we are delighted to have you. I am so delighted to be here. The next day, Scrooge hurried in early to be in the office ahead of his clerk. <laughs> I have no doubt I'll catch Bob coming in late. Look, it's already a full 18 minutes past the hour. Ooh, there he is, to my office. What do you mean by coming in here at this time of day? I'm very sorry, sir. I'm behind my time. You are well behind indeed. Yes, I think you are. Step this way, sir, if you please. It's only been once a year, sir. It, <laughs> it shall not be repeated. I, I was making rather merry yesterday. Now, I'll tell you what, my friend. I'm not going to stand this sort of thing any longer. And therefore, and therefore, I'm about to <laughs> raise your salary. Oh, oh, <laughs> a Merry Christmas, Bob! A merrier Christmas, Bob, my good fellow, than I have given you for many a year. I'll raise your salary and endeavor to assist your struggling family. And we will discuss your affairs this very afternoon over a Christmas bowl of smoking Bishop Bob. Make up the fires and buy another coal scuttle before you dot another I, Bob Cratchit. <laughs> To Tiny Tim, he did not die. He was a second father. He was as good a friend, as good a master, as good a man as the good old city knew. Or any other good old city, town, or world in the good old world. Some people laughed to see the alteration in him, but he let them laugh and little heeded it. He had no further intercourse with spirits, and was always cynical. 
but that's he knew how to keep Christmas well. Any man alive possessed the knowledge. May that be true of said of us. And all of us. So as Tiny Tim observed. God bless us, everyone. Thank you.